happy Monday. Welcome. We're going to do another story chat. That's what we're here for. We're going to chat story. Hopefully you guys are doing a lot of work in making your stories awesome. And uh, we're basically going to have a conversation like we always do about tips and tricks and getting the most out of what you're doing and uh, hopefully progressing and, and getting, you know, advancing your stories. That's what this is all about. We have we always have a cool conversation. In fact, a lot of cool people show up. And this is why uh, this is why we do it, so that we can have a network of people and just you know just have a cool combo about some storytelling and stuff. All right, good to see you, Chad. What's up, my friend? How are you? Uh, so we're beaming from uh, Facebook and Instagram, and uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some updates today, and also where to find some inspiration about your stories. Uh, I had a chance to, to take some time off uh, over the weekend and also uh, really connect with some people, which was great, and talk story. And it was nice to, to just be able to think and have a clear mind about this stuff. So first thing about updates, um, I've been working on a couple of things uh, uh, on the personal side of a short film and trying to get that. And it, it became really technical really quick. And this is actually something that uh, is pretty fun for me because it's more problem solving how to figure it out. And that was one of the reasons why the last time we chatted, it's it's more about um, just a reminder that you, you also have to be a technical artist here. Part of being an artist, no matter what you do, is understanding and, and mastering your tools, whether it be a pencil, a paintbrush, you know, Photoshop, digital program, or getting even more in depth and doing 3D and that kind of thing. If you, the more, the more adept you are at using your tools, the better you're going to be when it comes to expressing yourself as an artist. So that's why I always recommend that there is a there is a practical side, there's a technical component to being an artist, and then there's the creative side and the the thinking, inspiration, creativity side of being an artist. You really need to have both, and especially in today's day and age where you want to be competitive. And you want to be, um, yeah, you want to be able to uh, to have a strong footing out there on the marketplace to make your stuff really strong. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that I've been working on is also conceptualizing uh, new ideas, coming up with pitches, and this is something I've been working on for the last couple months. And it's it's actually uh, for me it's a slow process because I really have to sit down and think and have a you know, kind of isolate myself sometimes and really understand what I'm trying to pitch, how to make it original, and how to give that twist. So this came to mind because I wanted to um, just share some of the things that I've been going through is that everything that we do as artists, uh, our life experience, we should be able to use that as ammunition to tell our stories, okay? And part of it is... Uh, some life experience, some just events that have happened uh, either in my life or through friends or stories that you take that and you use that and be able to come up with an original concept that you can pitch as a story. So this is like, the reason I say this is that as you're going through your day to day, let's say you, you wake up in the morning and your normal routine, you might be looking just around your house and things that you can be turning into stories. Right? Do you play with your dog in the morning? Uh, you know, do you do you have uh, kids and you you know you get them up and to go to school or, or get them ready for breakfast? Like, is there some kind of ritual that you do? And is that can that be can that can you turn that into a story? Sometimes, like a funny event will happen. You'll trip on something and then you know you, you spill things on the kitchen table and it falls over. Who knows, right? And that may not be like a major event in your life, but can you take that? as inspiration and twist that into something that's actually worth telling other people. This is part of um, part of your storytelling. So now other events happen. So like uh, uh, some of the stories that I'm working on or are, are things that I'm familiar with so that I can, if I have to do more research, I already know where to go and how to understand these things. It's also uh, things that maybe I've read. So if, if you've read some either fiction or nonfiction, maybe you like history and you like reading up on certain artists in history or certain political figures or historical figures and you just like doing that you know you might want to think about how you can take that and either create a new fictional character based on things that are you know from reality or uh actually doing a story on something like you know an, an old president or the founding fathers or something like that right um 
everything should be ammunition for our stores. So I have a couple of those that are cooking. Now the key here is that when I when I have the idea in my head, I think it's I think there might be some potential there. I'll start jotting down notes and I'll start creating uh, some sketches. And then I actually start breaking these down into the story structure. So I have my method of doing so. And what happens is I sometimes hit a wall. And this is what I want to share with you guys. And sometimes I hit a wall and say, wow, okay, when I first had this idea, I thought it was so great that other people should, should listen to it and I could pitch this thing. But then I hit this wall, I'm like, ah, oh, this actually is not that interesting. <laughs> what I thought was so cool actually just turns out to be a boring, boring and bland thing. So then what I have to do is break that down even further and think about how can I twist this and make this unique so that the events that we're, that we're doing in this story it kind of takes on a life of its own and uh, you know, especially if I'm doing something fiction, right? I'm not necessarily doing something true to life or trying to repeat a story that actually happened. Uh, I'm trying to come up with something creative in fiction and that kind of thing. So then what can I do that will make it so that the audience does not have, like they can't see it coming, it's not predictable. The expectation of what happens in the story does not meet result, okay? That's another pillar that I, I repeat often is that you you kind of give them a new twist or something they didn't expect because it's really boring to go through a story and know where it's going and understand, you know, you can almost predict what the outcome would be. That's just lame. What you want to do is create something that is uh, original, that keeps people guessing, and that you, you have some twists and turns that make it exciting to actually, you know, have that experience of going through a story. So that is something that I start from you know, experience in real life or maybe something I've read or something I've seen or some story that somebody's told me and then I'll start figuring out how I can add my own unique creative bent on it. And that's the exploration that we have to go through, okay? Um, so my recommendation for you guys out there is that, is as you're going through your day-to-day, -day, think of, you know, you might want to do that. I used to do this for a while. Is that at, In the evening time, I would take out my sketchbook and I'll, in fact, I should show you my sketchbook in a second, but... Um, I would take out my sketchbook and I would go over what happened that day, you know, and especially before we had crazy lockdowns and stuff. It's like, did I take public transportation to work? Was there something weird at the coffee shop or some random character was, uh, did I see something really cool on the street? Like somebody dressed really uniquely or, or something, right? Maybe uh, at work when you're going through your normal routine, something happened that was out of the ordinary. And so this is something you take notes and I'll, I'll jot these things down and make little comic sketches in my sketchbook. And then that's usually um, what I'll use later on to co go back to that and actually create the story. So in my sketchbook, I'll create, I'll actually write these down in written words, in written form. Sometimes I'll do sketches on the side and, uh, and I'll go back and I'll say story note. So sometimes if you actually look at my sketchbook, I have that written there, story note, which means like I'm taking, I'm jotting down mental notes of what I think could be a story. And I have all kinds of stories like this. I have, you know, one of the ones I'm working on was a, is a, is a mime who can bring, who has magical powers and can bring his magic to life and pass it on to other people. That's a, a story that I ended up actually producing and shooting and we're now in post-production uh, putting that together. So um, that was one of the ones that was actually inspired by somebody who told me a similar story and I thought it was really cool. So how could I, how could I do that in my own way? Uh, so just, just for an idea for you guys, so you keep things, you keep your creative juices flowing and that you're always thinking of story. That's the reason you carry around a sketchbook. Now, recently somebody gave me the sketchbook, which is so awesome. I was really appreciative of that. And uh, I started using it and let's see if it's not too bleached out. Some of the, you can see, I just, I started doodling random things. And then, you know, I used, I used, um, let me see if I can, like some, some of the stuff I've been doing lately is just like some figure drawing. Um, hold it up to the camera and these are from photo reference and stuff uh, and I was kind of you know kind of working on my anatomy so a lot of times it's not always just like creative stuff sometimes I like to do my like dojo exercises or what I call them for um, just just practicing right and, and practicing your, your drawing skills that's one way that I lose myself in um, here's some more like action pose kind of stuff because I lose myself in, in my sketchbook and just try and, and uh, I don't know, uh, kind of de-stress and decompress when I do that stuff. You know, I'm also thinking, like, don't ever turn your brain off when you start drawing. But this, this type of sketchbook is great. So you can take this around anywhere. You can, you can leave it, you know, leave it in front of my TV so that even when I'm watching TV and doing Netflix and stuff, I have it there. I can jot out some notes and I can, I can write things down. So I always, this is a, this is a pretty big one. This is like a... 
I think it's a nine by 12 uh, sketch with nine inches by 12 inches. And so this is something you put in your backpack, you take with you. This is like something that maybe you would have around your house or when you go plan out to go sketching, um, like an excursion or you're going to the park or something like that, you could, you know you're gonna take that sketchbook. I have another one that's much smaller that I always carry in my back pocket or I put it in my jacket. And that one I can, I can break out at any minute. Uh, so just if I can do a quick, quick sketch at a coffee shop or something like that, I'll have that handy. Um, so that's always cool. I have a cat, so you can uh, sometimes you'll jump on my lap as I'm as I'm doing these uh, live streams, and uh, I, so I draw my cat a lot of times, and um, that's free model right there. <laughs> okay, so anyway, those are some good um, ideas. Hopefully that you guys can take to uh, jot down your stories. And just like I said, if you have a pet, if you have a kid, if you have you know roommates or whatever, those are that's ammunition for stories. In fact, I had a, a roommate, a good friend of mine, who's also a filmmaker, and he has a story that uh, you know, he, eventually he might produce about our experience as roommates together because we had a really fun house and there's a lot of characters coming in and out uh, when we we're in college. And so this is, uh, this is one of the stories that he has that he's gonna develop. So it's kind of it's based on reality, but he's, he's making it fiction to exaggerate a lot of things that are happening. So that's, that's like Friends, that's like Seinfeld, that's like all of these shows that we're familiar with they all do that, right? They, they're, they're based on something, but then they, they give you that extra twist to make it entertaining. Um, cool, anyway, let me say hi to everybody and let me, let me take some questions. Hopefully you guys are, have some things on your mind and let me know if any of this makes sense because if it doesn't, I wanna kind of help unlock the mystery to, to some of this. And uh, let me adjust my camera, it's all, it's all crooked. Um, so, yo, all right, it's good to see everybody on here. Um, hey, John Claude, you got an awesome question here. What's up, buddy? Let me let me say this out loud for people. So, uh, John Claude here, who's a storyboard artist, is asking Sergio, when it comes to storytelling, come up with boards. Do you always break down your your act one, two, and three on a side scrap of paper, or does it happen naturally for you when you are boarding out the sequence? Um, yeah, good question. You know, I'm very, I'm a very structured type of person. That's just the way my mind works is I like, I like order and I like a method to use. And okay, and then I'll, let me explain why I do that. Because I'm not the kind of person like my, my own, and maybe you guys can, can relate to this. I'm not the kind of person that just naturally can pick something up and I'm amazing at it. I have to work at it. It's really hard work for me to actually um, master something, get good at something. And so that, that goes for anything. If I'm like playing music or I'm, I'm trying to learn some kind of new yoga or exercise or something, I'm, or dance move, right? <laughs> it's really hard for me to, to learn that stuff. So I have to break it down in a very methodical way. So what I've learned over the years is story structure. So when it comes to doing act structure and that kind of thing, I will absolutely break it down. And I'll tell you why this benefits me and hopefully you know you guys can relate, is that when you know your act structure, you have a target to hit. You have these points that you are mapping out, okay? It's kind of like a general outline or general, general map. So let's say after act one, the character has a challenge, okay? And he has to meet that challenge. Either he makes it or he does it. After act two, uh, he has another challenge, okay? And you wanna outline these things. And then act three, he has the biggest, most amazing epic challenge there is, and he has to win it in order to uh, conquer his fears, let's say. So you already have a couple of points that you can map out. And then through those stories, you start aiming there and, and hitting it and hitting those points story-wise, okay? And that's, to me, at least a guide, a general structure that you can have. And then you can start boarding out. And so what I find is that that structure actually gives you freedom. Those limitations that you place on yourself, either by the deadline or by having a structure, will give you a little bit of freedom that within that you can be as creative as possible. You can go in all types of directions but you know that at the end you have to hit that mark for the act one, two, or three act break, okay? So that's my method of doing it. And when it comes to like sketching, as far as like how physically I do it, do I sketch on a side of paper? Do I do it on thumbnails? Uh, most of the time, if I'm actually breaking down structure, I will just jot a, a written note <laughs> that says, uh, you know, character has to beat the dragon, let's say, I'm making things up here, after act one, okay? And, uh, and that way, uh, you know, I can do a sketch, like what first pops into my mind if somebody has like a sword fight for some like fire breathing dragon or something. Uh, I might do that, but at least I like noted 
either on a piece of paper and usually you know on front of the computer so I'll write this on some kind of like digital you know word document or a Google Doc and, uh, and that way I jot, jot down those general bullet point notes it's very basic then I'll go in and start doing drawings in my drawing program right so if I'll, I'll break out the Photoshop and actually have the thumbnail template uh, or my storyboard template and draw that okay um, I find that so that's my own personal way of doing it if I know others who are much more free-flowing they will have a character they'll start with a character design and they just go they just as as they're boarding and creating ideas they'll just move that character through different situations then later on they kind of edit it and see how it's how it's going I prefer a different method I prefer the one that has targets and that way because I'm all about efficiency too so this is my like this is my brain how it works it's just very structured one two three and I, I really like efficiency I don't like to waste time I don't like to waste drawings or waste energy um, uh, or I like to I, I shouldn't call it a waste but it's just like structuring my my exploration points so I don't get carried away so the, there's a danger in this and this is why I appreciate this method because I've learned from others I didn't create this stuff on my own uh, others have taught me this is that if you if you kind of squeeze your creativity in a certain way in a certain direction it will you, you push yourself to have a result and that's kind of why I do that so I know there's a little bit of rambling there but hopefully that makes sense hey Tim what's up thanks for the compliment there buddy um, good to see you guys by the way uh, so hey George what's up my friend George Castro is here uh, and he's got a question Sergio have you directed live action features or is that a goal for you now I uh, I was working up until a couple months ago or actually about a month ago we were uh, uh, designing and writing rewriting a, a live action feature and it's still it's still cooking and that is um, that was one of the ones that uh, I was hoping to do so yes that is definitely a goal for me I love storytelling whether it be animation or live action and I would absolutely love to do um, live action features so I was uh, slated to co-direct a a, uh, a a live action feature based on an alien story an alien invasion story it's a comedy which was uh, it's a really cool concept so when that hits I'll let you guys know but of course with the way things work in storytelling you got to be hush hush until these things actually come out okay <laughs> so um, yeah so let me that's another thing I should mention is that as a story artist you have your storyteller first right so uh, you can go back and forth for many different things now I, I've some of you guys who have been following me for a while know that I've directed an animation and I've done a bunch of things there so um, it's the same film language it's the same like thinking process the medium the end medium is different so instead of you know actually animating things out and, and using animators as the, the final acting tool in live action you're using different set of, 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 of tools so to speak um, you got your cinematographer you have live action actors who bring a lot to the project and um, it's a different way of getting a, you know a storytelling result which is very very exciting and so I like all of that stuff I'm also amazed and fascinated by all the guys doing like stop motion animation, like the guys from Leica or um, Ardman Studios. I'm because I don't know that world very well. I I know the the pre production side and actually creating the story, but when it comes to animating stop motion, I'm so impressed of, of how those guys actually produce those things. So that's really cool. But yeah, I totally love that stuff, and it's good to have goals. By the way, I always wanted to you know direct something uh, when I was you know even when I was a kid I was thought oh yeah that's so cool it'd be so cool to be part of a project and direct something you know have my own creative stamp on things and then now that as my career has developed I've had opportunities to do some of these things and I just want to keep growing there's more goals and I think that's something that we should all do I really admire people um, you know out there who are who are working into the later years like Ridley Scott for example he, he must be in his 70s and he's still cranking out amazing work you got James Cameron who's a juggernaut right Spielberg of course all these like guys that I think I grew up with in the 80s um, who are still working today and producing amazing amazing work right they're still really strong filmmakers cool um, and you guys I want to see what you're doing so hopefully you, you have some cool projects and things that that you're up to let me say let me give it a shout out to people here on um, Instagram so let's see Abby John say dot story says uh, Hey man, do you have uh, personal strategies? Um, do you have personal strategies to deviate away or combine tropes for storytelling? 
you know, what I do is I, I really I'm – a, I'm a fan of the, um, of the Save the Cat method. And I think you guys have heard me like uh, do that book recommendation from Blake Schneider, the Save the Cat. And I like his way of breaking down genres. So, so what I do when, I, when it comes to my strategy of, of coming up with ideas – I'll start with a genre that I like. So, and you know, you can start with horror or action or romance or whatever it is that, that you're into. He breaks it down into a in a, to a different category. He has like funny terms like monster in the house and um, what are some of the other ones? Uh, uh, if I remember off the top of my head, uh, there is there's like a buddy story, which is like a love story, um, things like that. He breaks it down into kind of a different set of categories and genres because you can have uh, you can have a buddy picture that is an action film. You can also have a buddy picture that's a love story. Uh, you can have a, a horror film that is, um, you know, it's a romance. So you, so you can like cross pollinate these like categories. And well, anyway, let me get back to, to answer your question a little bit. What, what do I do when I'm coming up with these ideas? I will pick a genre that I'm into and I will, um, and I'll, I'll kind of see where it goes. So one of the ones, one of the pitches that I'm working on uh, is a, uh, it's just because I, I just like this, this aesthetic. It's kind of a post-apocalyptic uh, revenge story, okay? <laughs> and this has to do with the character. I don't want to give away too much because I'm still developing it and it might change. But it's a character that uses a certain method to, uh, a, a certain fighting method that um, in order to get revenge and uh, and he gets double crossed by the people he was hired uh, that had have trained him in that in that martial art method so to speak um, at any rate so that's the way I pick that and then I and I start looking for reference and I'll break those things down now I also you know I like to do many different things so I have comedies I have action stuff I have you know like this one post-apocalyptic things I have lighthearted things and more dark things but th those are some of the ways that I that I get get on get in on that stuff right um oh so the the just so you to repeat the book it's called save the cat um i'm trying to think about i had it on my desk uh a while ago because i keep it really close and I, I love using that as reference so save the cat by blake schneider go to storyboard art you see some of that in our past live streams i think we gave a, a bunch of book recommendations as well so um hopefully you guys can uh, can and can check that out you know it's it's called save the cat but it's a screenwriting book Okay. <laughs> and if you read it, you'll understand why he, uh, he calls it Save the Cat, because he, he likes to inject in every story a Save the Cat moment, which basically has somebody who saves a cat. Okay, let's imagine that literally. And then that makes the audience empathize with that character and like that character because he's doing something noble and heroic. That's why he calls it the Save the Cat method. Okay. Um, and there are a few books in that series. There's a part one, two, and three. All of those books are great. I highly recommend them, and uh, even if it's as a starting point, because they're actually not very big, they're not that deep, but I think they have a really good summary. Another, now that we're on the subject, um, is uh, another book is Story by Robert McKee. Certainly, uh, Sid Field's book when it comes to um, screenwriting is one of the, the standards that people really, uh, really like. So you guys can can check those out. Okay. Um, let me get a sip of water, answer some more of these questions. Uh, this, this is a cool question from Jason here. Jason Confessor is asking, uh, hey, do you change your style? Uh, do you change or tweak your drawing style depending on the story? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I my nat, like, let's say normal tendency is to draw something more realistic and like kind of hard angled and like exaggerated proportions. That's just something I, I personally like to do. But your drawing style should reflect the story that you're, you're working on. So if you're doing something more comedic and lighthearted, you might want to consider drawing more rounded shapes, rounded mouth shapes, maybe more cartoony proportions so the characters aren't as long. They're like shorter and wider. Um, you might want to lean on some of the things that are in the past, like the Looney Tunes or you know Disney stuff that would create that kind of lighthearted feel. Um, or stuff like Ren and Stimpy or Cartoon Network, what, what they're producing, uh, more graphic style if you want. So you're going to change your style that way. Then uh, if you're going to do something more realistic and more dramatic, that's when you might want to think about doing something like based on comics and like Batman's style, which is very graphic. Um, 
uh, I mean graphic in the sense that it is uh, it's black and white there's a lot of contrast but the proportions are more human they got like human anatomy and and uh, more realistic like eight head style proportions so yeah I do change up my drawing style depending on the story if I have my default style and nobody's asking for me to change it up it'll probably be like a, a simplified version of like kind of comic book stuff and I think if you look up any of my drawings, um, you can see that uh, I can share that stuff with you guys on another uh, live stream if you want. So uh, let me let me ask this uh, let me answer this question here. Uh, hopefully, I'm I'm not butchering your name here. Nujin Huang is asking, how do you think about uh, bringing back 2D animation? You know, I'm a huge fan of 2D animation and my hat goes off to the guys at Spa Studios who just did uh, Klaus for Netflix. Uh, I, a little story, a little backstory there. I worked with those guys back in 2001, I think it was, when it wasn't Spa Studios, that was before Sergio Pablos took it over, another Sergio. <laughs> and uh, he came in as an animation director and a consultant, and we finished up a, a film called The Three Wise Men, and I was an animator back then, and I also did some layout and some story um, in the story department. And that was uh, a great experience. And then Sergio Pablos came in and he, he brought a lot to that. He was a great uh, addition to that. And I think he, he ended up taking over that studio. Those guys were, were doing awesome work for many years. And then they, I think they, this was the, the one that kind of hit it big for them is Klaus and it's getting them a lot of exposure. And that's, 2D, that's a 2D animated film combining a, a lot of different um, techniques as well, right? It's not straight 2D. Um, they also have 3D stuff, and they're they're doing a lot of really cool coloring, um, rendering techniques that are that are happening there with the lighting. But the basis of the animation is 2D uh, hand drawn animation, whether you do it digitally or, or I think some of it was actually drawn on paper and scanned in, just like the old days. So I love that stuff. I think it's certainly valid. You can do. It's like you're, there's no limit to your imagination. If you want to do a different style, it doesn't always have to be this round, solid, like blocky, you know, thing that that uh, 3D animation gives you, right? That's why I love looking at Leica and the way that just the textures and the beautiful lighting that you get with an actual lit three, you know, three-dimensional set of puppets, right? There's like a physical set, and these guys are sewing the fabric onto the characters and stuff. It just gives a much more, uh, a much different and beautiful aesthetic. So there's it just the really the the sky's the limit when it comes to doing animation and those things and especially 2d animation i actually don't think it's going to die i think uh some people at some point thought it would die off that's why i, I give i'm rooting and I, I give my hats off to guys like spa studios who are, are bringing that back and there's some really talented 2d animators who are still working you know they're working their game obviously some of the more well-known guys are like james baxter and uh and well sergio pablos that guy is, is also an amazing 2d animator um uh, Borhan Montoya, who you, you guys, Mon oh sorry, Borhan Montoro, I'm pronouncing his last name wrong, is also, you, you may not know who he is, I, I uh, you might want to look him up on Instagram, he is a fantastic uh, character designer, and also 2D animator, um, I had the pleasure of meeting him and working briefly with him over there in Spain, at any rate, there's awesome professionals working out there, so yeah, 2D animation, let's all bring it back, <laughs> how's that? All right, let's keep it going with a couple more questions. We'll call this one, but I'm, I'm glad to see so many people active in storytelling. And yeah, hopefully you guys are all working on some really cool projects. Um, when do you think it's important? This is a great question here from, from, yeah, Marcus. When do you think it's important to draw to draw lighting and show values? I think it's important when it has something to do with the story. Otherwise, I would just leave it out. Um, that's my own personal preference. I don't put lighting for lighting's sake. I don't render things up to to just have a, a just have polish, you know. If I have time and I'm into it, you know, I might do a couple tones and shadows and things. But if the lighting has something to do with the story, if it's a dramatic kind of noir film or something like that, then I put lighting in my boards. But values, I'll only use values to separate the the characters in silhouette, you know, separate them from the background. But unless there's a specific story point, I keep things really, really simple. And I encourage you guys to do so as well because I don't want you to get lost in the elements and the composition because oftentimes what happens, it gets cluttered. And if you keep things simple, you'll be able to selectively add things that enhance the story, okay? And so you can pop things out with lighting. You can, you're gonna have 
a lighting design, hit the characters, that's always really good and smart. Um, but don't just put things in there to uh, just to for for flash sake, right? To make things flashy or or just to add like an, an extra you know set of polish there. Leave that for later. If you haven't resolved the story issues, no amount of good lighting or values or tone or rendering is going to save that. You fix your story first, then go after the other stuff that is what I would consider minor uh, compared to the story issues, right? Good good question, by the way. Um, yeah, a lot of you guys have seen Klaus. That's great. I love it. Uh, you know, t 2D animation is just as hard and, and is just as much of an art form as any other form of animation when it comes to stop motion, 3D, whatever. Um, you know, a skilled animator is a skilled animator. Those guys know what they're doing. Uh, yeah. And it's great that you guys are all in support of that. I think, you know, I would encourage everybody just on a general note, if that's something that you're into, don't let the industry trends throw you off. I mean, for many years, people went into 3D animation instead of 2D animation. And there were like a real strong group of people that kept the 2D animation alive. And just because they like that aesthetic and now there's like a resurgence of that, you know, certainly one thing that's really great that I think they've been really strong and consistent is like, uh, the, uh, you know, in Japan, uh, 2D animation has always been really, really strong. And it's not just straight 2D animation. They combine it with 3D. They're combining it with other techniques. But the aesthetic is what they were after. And, you know, sometimes they do 2D animation, sometimes they do 3D, sometimes they'll do a mix. Um, so it just depends on the project. But I think it's great to see that there are certain, there, there are many different, uh, there are many different examples of techniques and storytelling methods out there. So same thing goes with live action. Sometimes you do it black and white. Sometimes you do it with uh, some certain kinds of lenses. And other times you do, you do different stuff. So... Uh, so cool. This is great, great discussion. So let me see, let me, um, let me see, let me get, get to some of these other last questions here and then we'll call it a night. Yeah, love it. So there's a, more comments. If you guys have any films, by the way, that you recommend, I've just, I just, uh, recommended Klaus. And if you guys haven't seen that, I recommend you do. It's a it's a Christmas film, but it is uh, it's wonderful. You can watch that any time of the year. <laughs> and so uh, that's that's a uh, that's a film recommendation I, I recommend you guys uh, check out because the modern a modern film came out I think last year, and it's certainly worthy to to check out. Uh, so let me take this this question from uh, Maury Loeb's 2010. Hopefully I'm I'm not butchering your 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 handle there. So, hey, Sergio, do you think that a story artist, a storyboard artist could get a job in a 3D previs company? Absolutely, my friend. That is a very valuable position to have, and it's a very useful position to have. Um, I, know, uh, I know that there are previs studios in LA, you know, places like, uh, I think, well, there's the third floor, which is a, a famous one. There is, uh, what is it, Pixel? Uh, I'm trying to remember the name. I think it's uh, a Pixel Revolution, Pixel Logic. No, Pixel Logic is the one. In... Anyway, you guys help me out. But there's a bunch of previous studios in, in LA. I know they have in the past hired storyboard artists to uh, to create images, to create a you know a starting point for the previous guys to use. And I also know that um, I know many board artists who also know how to do previs. That you know, I would call them. Uh, thank you, Pixel Lever. Pixel Liberation Front. Thanks, George. Appreciate that. PLF. Um, they do previs in LA. They're uh, oh hell, hell on Entertainment. Keep them coming. <laughs> so these are all previs studios. You guys can look up and, and check out. And I think if I if I if I'm not mistaken, you know, you guys who have worked for those places, please correct me. But they hired board artists uh, to do traditional storyboards to start out that way. I also recommend, you know, this is what I was saying at the beginning. Know your tools and know your your um, your different mediums so that if you're a story artist that you can also do uh, previs, you know how to do 3D, you know how to use your cameras. And that way, if you have to, you can do your own previs or you can help out on a project. I've done that. And at first I was a little bit reluctant to get into that. But after a while, I realized that there is a value to doing that. And I, um, and I got into it and I know how to do that stuff. So I'm not scared of, of doing my own previs or helping out people doing 3D cameras and setting up uh, layout shots because it, it's storytelling and that also helps to get my vision across and make sure that it's going to be um, 
it's going to be accurate to what the animators and the layout artists are going to do afterwards. So that's that's one way of like making sure that you are you are getting your vision across and you're and you're being responsible for your scenes and your sequences by doing your own previs and that kind of thing. So yeah, absolutely, it's good to be a, a storyboard artist. And they have gotten hired by not only previs companies, I'll also say video game companies and guys doing cinematics. So all of that is is really cool. Um, all right, my friends, I think I'm going to call this one. If you guys have any more questions and stuff, come to us. Check out what we're doing at Storyboard Art. I will mention just real quick that uh, Lightbox Expo is coming up. So you guys who remember that from last year, it was an in-person event in Pasadena. Now it's going to be online because of this whole corona thing. But this is, I think, a benefit for a lot of people because we're going to get a lot more exposure. We're going to have people. It's going to be global, right? You don't actually have to be in LA this, LA this time. And we're, we're planning a lot of cool talks and a lot of live streams that are going to happen during Lightbox Expo. So I encourage you guys to check that out. We're going to do more announcements to that as they come through. All right. Well, thanks for, for hanging out tonight. And uh, good luck on all your projects. And we'll talk soon, my friends. Uh, keep working hard. Okay. See ya.